Welcome everybody to the first webinar of our series. Um, we're very glad and um, proud to be able to kick it off with a panel of presenters. Um, the title of our webinar is Does It Matter? The Socioeconomic Value of Earth Science Data Information Applications. And our first speaker will be Aaron Robinson. Hi, thanks, Erika, and hi, everybody. Um, I'm really delighted to see that we have 25 people on right now, um, and it's being recorded, and so this will be shared um, via our YouTube stream um, shortly after this call is over. And as Erika mentioned, this is our first webinar of a series of six um, that we're going to have around our theme, Data for our Changing Earth, Realizing the Socioeconomic Value of Earth Science Data. So, Erika, if you can go to the next slide. Um, and so I'm Erin Robinson, I'm the Executive Director of ESIP, and ESIP is the Earth Science Information Partners, and they have a vision to be the leader in promoting the collection, stewardship, and use. And Arika, this is a build slide, so if you can just click three more times. Um, and really, that's a, a broad vision, um, and ESIP primarily has focused on the collection and stewardship of data, and I think with this goal, it's a little bit of a stretch goal for us um, into the use and, um, and the importance of earth science data and information. Next slide. So ESIP as a community comes together across the data life cycle, which are those bubbles in the middle um, from data repositories, researchers, and application and tool developers. Um, and then they also come together across earth science and environmental science domains and across sectors. So academic industry and agency partners are all coming together around common issues um, that they identify as a community. So it's a very grassroots effort um, identifying issues that are, are hurdles and impediments to using earth science data effectively. Um, and they come together at the human and organizational level um, through ESIP activities, and then they go back to their home institutions and actually implement um, agreements and conventions that they've, um, and learning that they've um, taken away from ESIP. Next slide. And so this just emphasizes the fact that ESIP works at this human and organizational level of sharing knowledge um, and best practices and current practices um, and not at the information um, software, hardware, um, you know, things that we commonly think of as cyber infrastructure. Um, ESIP is a layer that sits on top of that. And I think that that's made ESIP unique in the, um, the way that we don't compete with our members. So we bring people together around um, topics. And I think that the idea of the socioeconomic value of data is one of those um, topics that's been emergent for a while um, and the community is really interested in convening around. Next slide. So a lot of this can seem kind of chaotic and the way that ESIP organizes itself is into small groups called clusters. Um, and I think that this socioeconomic value of data um, could be the inception of a cluster, this webinar series. Um, we haven't actually done sort of a, a more kind of general cross ESIP webinar series before. So this, this idea is a first. Um, but the way that we organize ourselves is within clusters. And then we also have a shared agenda with these four strategic goals. And we've been methodically moving through the strategic goals year by year. So last year we focused on um, strengthening the ties between observation and user communities. And this year, we are um, focusing on this goal to promote techniques to articulate and measure the socioeconomic value of earth science data, information, and applications. And one of the things about these strategic goals is that ESIP has, um, has had a few strategic plans between 2008 and now 2020. And this goal has been one of the, the goals that has continued to stay on the list, but we haven't done much in terms of focusing. And I feel like maybe just with the GeoValue book coming out um, and the work that Jay and Francois and the panelists on this call have done, I think that the time is ripe to talk about this in a um, in a more open setting. Um, and so that's the focus of our team um, and, and our theme and our community. Um, and Erika, I think this slide has a build too. Um, and so the only other thing I'll say about ESIP is that we do have these values of being open and collaborative and collegial. And really this is a pre-competitive space. So I would ask <coughs> listen to this webinar thinking about what are the kind of common things that we could all do um, in our own practices to take forward and to move move these ideas forward so with that i really thank everybody for coming and um, i'm looking forward to the panel
Okay, my name is John King. I'm a professor in the School of Information at the University of Michigan. You should see on the slides now uh, pictures of our three panelists, uh, Francois Perlman, Jamie Cruz, and Leah Shanley. And we're going to go through them in that order. And um, I just want to remind everybody that our biggest constraint is time. So the panelists are asked to uh, restrict their presentations to about 10 minutes, and I will let people know if they go too long, and then we'll have a 15 minutes or so for questions, and uh, we can run a little bit over, but not too much over. So with that, we'll turn to Francois. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Um, I'm Francois Perlman, and I'm one of the founding members of the GeoValue community of practice. First, I would like to thank ESIP for the opportunity to organize this web webinar series. In this presentation, I will introduce the GeoValue community of practice, discuss some of the reference material, including our website and the books that we already mentioned, the book organization follows the value chain from the Earth's observation to the information to decision making and includes a number of use case examples. In addition to following the book organization, I'm going to talk about the multidisciplinary nature of the community and the associated challenges regarding communications. Next chart, please. As Erin just mentioned, the objectives of this webinar is to support ESIP's strategic goal around the socioeconomic value of data. This first chart is there to put all of us on the same starting point, suggesting some of the questions that we are going to want to address, as well as introducing the concept of the value chain. What are value chains? A value chain can be defined as a set of value-adding activities that one or more organizations perform in creating and distributing goods and services. This is by Longhorn and Blakemore, 2008. This traditional definition has been adapted to the information age. A value chain consi considers the geospatial data sources the processing of the data into value-added information to be incorporated into decision support systems, leading to the decision maker's actions. The example in this chart is one of many. There are many examples which uh, are given in, in the book and in other venues. Next chart, please. This is an introduction to the GeoValue community. It's an international interdisciplinary group of economists, scientists, engineers from the public and private sector and policy experts who've been working together over several years to develop methodologies for valuing Earth's observation. We have organized workshops of problems connectly every 18 months alternating between US and Europe. The mix of participants has evolved over time. We started with primarily computer scientists and geoscientists and progressively added communication experts, economists and social scientists. Some of the most recent workshops are listed on the right hand side of this view graph. A number of presentations are available on the GEO website under the workshop tab. Outcomes have been documented as proceedings recorded either in IEEE Explore or published in USGS letters. In addition to the workshop, we have organized AGU sessions under public affairs, presented posters at EGU, and participated in the group on Earth observation, plenaries and symposiums. Next chart, please. As a follow-on to the OECD workshop, 
which uh, we held in 2016. A number of us had the opportunity to participate in the development of the GeoValue book. The book followed the value chain from sensor observation to information to decision. Jamie Cruz, Yep Cramvot, and myself were editors. The book is organized in 18 chapters and was contributed to by 34 authors. In addition to the book, reference material includes the GeoValue website, geovalue.org, and a LinkedIn community group. Also, the LinkedIn community group is not very active at this time. Next chart, please. As mentioned earlier, the GeoValue book is organized according to the value chain. After some introductory material, individual chapters address the data acquisition and stewardship, followed by model implementation and by determination of the socioeconomic value. We need use cases to understand and explain the process, and those are very important. Next chart. Many disciplines need to be engaged when determining the socioeconomic value of our science data. At the core, in green, are technologies, natural sciences, economics, and social sciences. Those are complemented by the stakeholders, the users, from public and private organizations to decision makers and to citizens. An effective case study team would include representatives from many of these disciplines working in a co-design environment. By co-design, we mean that these uh, folks would work together from the beginning of the process to the end. Other societal consideration which can impact the outcome include politics, both international and national, law and regulations, moral and ethics. Those provide the uh, societal environment which is going to impact the recommendations provided by the case study team. Recommendations for implementation or for uh, policy changes. Next chart, please. Uh, as we just mentioned, a, a multidisciplinary team is likely to be working on a case study. Each discipline has its own language, making communications a challenge. Here are some examples of unique terminologies being used. So World Bank has developed a vocabulary you might consider as a useful source of definitions. And if you uh, look at these uh, terms, uh, for example, counterfactuals in economics, and if you are an Earth observation expert, this may not be a term that you're familiar with. No. Uh, similarly, pixels or swaths with may not be familiar terms to economists. Next, next chart. Uh, I mentioned already case studies. Case studies can cover any number of uh, Earth observation areas like uh, land cover and land use, solid earth, water, oceans. And uh, if you look at the type of case studies, they can address ecosystems, energy and mineral, natural hazard, harmful algae bloom in the ocean, an effect of increasing temperature on health as just a few of many. Uh, the chart shows the example of the harmful algal bloom, where you are integrating data coming from remote sensing with in situ data, processing uh, models, and then um, generating products which are going to support the decision by the decision makers. This, uh, this 
concludes my portion of the presentation and uh, the next chart should be given by uh, Jamie Cruz. Thank you. Okay, on to Jamie. Hello, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, um, well, uh, good morning or afternoon, depending on where you're located. Uh, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, what I wanted to talk about, since this is sort of the inaugural uh, portion of this webinar, is that we, we throw around the term values and valuation. And uh, I wanted to spend just a moment to uh, give a little background on what we mean <laughs> by valuation. And the next slide, please, that's my outline. Okay, well, so what I'm going to talk about is, is how do we come up with this notion of valuation and then as an economist, how would we approach measuring the value and then just briefly sort of di distinguishing between private, what economists would call private goods and public goods and then a short example. Next slide, please. Okay, this is almost economics 101, but I, I think Sometimes when we jump to valuation without thinking about the foundation on which it's, it's been built, uh, I think we've lost something in the interpretation. And so just for a moment, economics is about resource allocation. And what the idea is that we want to utilize finite resources and use them in the best way possible. And the best way possible is is meant to be beneficial to this and future generations. So the big question then is uh, who decides where the greatest benefit is and who, who, you know, what is the basis for measurement? Next slide, please. Okay, um, so from my perspective, the basic unit of analysis is the individual. What we're trying to do is identify through understanding the wants and needs of individuals within a societal group, which can be a societal group, can be a country, a community, or the world. We're trying to identify how, you know, what that individual's preferences are. We, none of us are the same. We, uh, some of us would prefer to drive different cars, eat different foods and enjoy different services. So how do we take these individual preferences and do something with them uh, to, uh, to come up with what we would call a societal or a socioeconomic value? And so we do use money, it's a metric. We could have used carbon <laughs> or many other things, but money is pretty handy because for when we look at especially the investment in scientific data, uh, geospatial data, uh, that is a significant investment. And so uh, money is okay to use as a metric, at least in my opinion. Uh, so if we're trying to measure these valuations, how do we come about looking at individuals and identifying sort of where their preferences are? Well, if we can observe transactions, then we have a pretty good handle, but many things we cannot measure that way. And so sometimes we have to ask, what is, how much would you be willing to pay for cleaner air or a, a, another park or something like that? Or how much would you accept to forego what you have? Next slide. Okay, so let's say we've got a group of individuals and they've indicated their value of some item and so uh, that's what this little graph is about next slide so what i would do as an economist is i would arrange those from highest to lowest now if this were entirely free <laughs> uh, i could just satisfy all of those individuals and the valuation that we could attach to that would be the sum of all those bars uh, if we have to restrict that then we start with the highest values and move down uh, next slide. And so lastly, that's sort of where a demand function comes from. And that's just a, a very brief introduction. Next slide, please. 
Okay, so when we think about private goods, private goods, as I said, it's fair, it's, it's possible to really nail down these valuation measures by observing what people do. And private goods are consumables, cars, food, theater tickets, whatever. However, there are goods that are called public goods whose use is not exclusive. It's parks, public safety, sanitation, and the like. Next slide, please. Okay, so what is information? What is data? Okay, there's a, there are some interesting things that we need to think about when we think about information and data. For one, consumption does not reduce the availability to others. If you ate an apple, it would not be available to somebody else. However, information can be made available uh, to many individuals without decreasing its availability. Now, if that information or data is uh, exclusive use, we can identify values that are attached to that. And some examples have been very recent use of social data and information that has come from that uh, has been used and sold. And we can identify the value that way. When that data is open source data, as much of our data is, then it really becomes a public good and uh, becomes much more challenging, but also much more useful to more people. Next slide. Okay, I'm going to go through just a brief example. And so I guess the point I'm trying to make is whenever we try to come up with a use case and then go back and say this particular satellite information or this particular uh, observational data has value, it becomes really challenging because for the most part, next slide, we don't use a single source. And sometimes there's substitutability between different sources of data. Some of it may be higher quality, higher resolution, but uh, all of that creates the challenge. And so this, uh, along the lines that uh, Francois was doing, I, I'm sort of constructing uh, an idea of a value chain, but we start with the data, but the data has to be processed and analyzed to be of use to individuals. Next slide, please. Okay, so I'm, in this particular example, I'm going to, uh, I'm showing you a very big picture that's gonna become a small picture in this chain. And this is from stream gauge data, as uh, during Hurricane, or after Hurricane Matthew, and so this is uh, fairly uh, local for me, but this was a, a prediction of flood stage for the Tar River in Greenville, North Carolina, next. Okay, and this uh, is the same information, but it is then uh, converted into another product uh, from uh, NOAA, and uh, also is giving some notion of how far this particular uh, flood event is, is the river supposed to be above flood stage at that location. Next slide. Okay, so those big pictures turned into little pictures and they were part of output and that's what I would call value added information. Um, sort of all those data sources came together to create those two products next. And so then those products become even more refined and they are put with other parts, pieces of geospatial data. And so this is a product from a North Carolina flood mapping program that is predict projecting the flood coverage of an area around that particular flood gauge. And so uh, the landing strips, I don't know if you can see in the upper corner, the triangle, that is the airport in Greenville, North Carolina next. Okay, this is another product that came from that and uh, you can see the airport again, uh, but this was produced for uh, the purpose of evacuation. And so this uh, was used by the emergency management community to define 
what would be the evacuation zones for that particular event. Next. Okay, so what we've done then is we've taken the value-added information and we've turned it into decision support systems. And then, uh, next. Okay, those decision support systems will go to the decision makers or are distributed uh, in ways that decision makers can utilize that and choose action. Now, to me, we are not done in assessing a value that's associated with this particular uh, data that has led to uh, information and then decision support systems. There's another step. And next slide, please. Okay, that is what we're really measuring when we're trying to get at value of this data is how it affects outcomes. And so uh, in this particular case, since it's a, a, an emergency management, a flood case, we're looking at measures that uh, the reduction in the loss of lives, the reduction in injury, uh, and so what we're looking for are marginal changes in these measures, in these outcomes, is really what the value of that really good information is. And so the counterfactual, I think, that was discussed was that what would we do without this or what would we do with the second best? Okay, next, please. Okay, so I think I've just, stated all that before, so I'm going to go on and I'm running out of time. And so I want to end, next slide, with what are the challenges here? And the challenges in trying to actually create a valuation exercise is you, you must identify who the users of that information are. In other words, who are the decision makers? Uh, what is the value of the outcomes of those decisions and the marginal value, the change, the reduction in loss of life? Uh, whether or not there are substitutes for the information that you're looking at. And then the middle thing is I would bet that most individuals that are looking at the flood maps or the evacuation zones and some of the individuals that even constructed those do not know all the sources of data that went into constructing those decision support systems. And so that's where one of the real challenges is, in my opinion, is attribution. How do we assign value to a particular uh, Earth observation method when there's many that are contributing and the individuals creating the decision support systems may not even know where it came from. Uh, so I believe that ends my presentation and uh, I wanna thank you for your attention. Very good. So we'll turn to Leah. Uh, I believe you're overseas, aren't you? Uh, yes, I'm in Geneva, Switzerland here for the uh, European Citizen Science Association meeting and the UN meetings, the Group on Earth Observations. Okay, a global event. Take it away. <laughs> well, thank you. And I, and I, I want to thank uh, the organizers and ESIP uh, for inviting me to participate. Um, today, I'm going to talk about uh, some of the possible value of citizen science or what is being called kind of non traditional uh, data sources. Um, next slide. Uh, so I think there's a lot of conceptions or different conceptions of what citizen science may be. Uh, people often associate it with education, but um, uh, it was originally uh, founded uh, and the Citizen Science Association in the U.S. and in Europe and elsewhere uh, are really focusing on citizen science as a scientific method uh, that engages the public to contribute, not just participate, but actually uh, con actively contribute to the advancement of scientific and engineering research and monitoring 
in ways that may include everything from identifying research questions uh, to designing and conducting the investigations, collecting data, developing low-cost sensors, uh, analyzing the data, uh, training the algorithms, um, and uh, even solving complex problems in some instances in ways that the professional scientists and their sophisticated algorithms were not able to do. I think often we think about citizen science as data collection, but it, it can be so much more. Next slide. Uh, a related term is volunteer geographic information. In fact, many of you may be familiar with the field of participatory mapping or PPGIS. Uh, VGI, as a good child dubbed it, uh, comes out of that uh, discipline. And it's very similar to citizen science. Uh, it's harnessing the tools uh, to create a, and assemble and disseminate geographic information provided voluntarily by a large group of individuals. And while I'm certainly a supporter of citizen science, I want to assure you uh, these crowdsourced approaches are not right for every scientific problem, uh, but they can be valuable when applied to the right problem and when designed uh, properly and using robust scientific methods. Next slide. Um, so this is a schematic that might, again, kind of visually represent uh, the range of activities in which members of the public uh, could contribute. Um, and you know, things like sample collection, geolocation measurements, um, uh, data analysis, annotation and transcribing data, et cetera. Next slide. Uh, I'm going to only give one example here, but there are many. Uh, some of you may be familiar with uh, the U.S. Phenology Network, uh, which is supported by the National Science Foundation, the U.S. Geological Survey. Uh, they have a project called Nature's Notebook that has volunteers around the country contributing millions of observations on plants and animals that scientists then use to analyze environmental change. Uh, this map in particular was looking at uh, leaf emergence of two species of poplar uh, that would uh, that data is being used to look at uh, the role of genes and environment in controlling poplar phenology. Uh, the citizen science or volunteer collected data uh, was used to make improve the models for the onset of spring and they found that particularly in the southeast spring was coming four to five weeks early. This, of course, has implications, a delayed spring for freezing damage to fruit crops. Uh, so there are economic uh, implications of that data. Uh, there were 40 peer-reviewed publications. Next slide. Next slide. Uh, so the U.S. federal government has made substantial, oops, jumped ahead there, has made substantial um, uh, federal investments in citizen science. Uh, the NSF, for example, has invested $265 million over the last six years. That's annualized at $44 million a year. They have made the biggest investments. Uh, NOAA, NASA, Health and Human Services, and other agencies are making, uh, you know, one to $10 million a year. Um, but these numbers are growing. Next slide, please. So when we think about the socioeconomic value or different ways of, of why citizen science and volunteer geographic information could be important, uh, we often think of them as ways to improve the spatial or temporal resolution of our data. So we want to use citizen science and VGI in areas where we can't get traditional data, where they can fill the gaps or where they can increase our geographic extent or temporal scale of our data. Um, citizen science also, or citizens, volunteers, can be used to analyze the imagery more rapidly, so they're training the algorithm, so human in the loop. Now with machine learning, uh, the eye often is better than the algorithm in detecting patterns. Uh, projects like Foldit, uh, where volunteers were asked to manipulate um, a protein, uh, they actually solved that uh, structure of the protein that leads to um, a medication for AIDS. Uh, far faster uh, after, uh, you know, in a matter of weeks compared to years for the professional uh, scientists. They can help to generate new ideas, new data applications, and create new business models or jobs. Next slide, please. There have been very limited studies, however, on the economic uh, economics of citizen science. There's been a couple of studies looking at reduced labor costs, 
Thibault, Thibault, for example, mm. uh, determined that the in-kind contributions of somewhere between one and two million people uh, for biodiversity projects, um, uh, 388 English-speaking biodiversity projects, was somewhere in the neighborhood of 2.5 billion a year, which I find that number quite surprising, but uh, it's interesting. Uh, McCatchney, I don't know how to pronounce it, reported uh, that terrestrial biodiversity in the United Kingdom alone for more than 30 different organizations had a uh, 20 uh, million pounds estimated value of in-kind contributions for a govern government investment of 7 million pounds. Next slide, please. Here in the U.S., uh, Henry Sauerman and colleagues estimated the total value of volunteer in-kind contributions just for the six, first six months alone across seven projects for Zooniverse, which is an online platform, and that includes like Galaxy Zoo uh, and Serengeti um, um, projects, uh, was in the order of $1.5 million. Um, so I think you know this can be some really interesting cost savings potential. However, next slide. Two studies that looked at cost benefit analysis found that direct costs such as staff and IT have been fairly well evaluated when looking at citizen science projects. Uh, however, ongoing costs are less frequently incorporated in these estimates. Uh, the information on the number of participants is often collected uh, but we don't really track how much time they're making uh, investing in the project. Usefulness of the data is evaluated, uh, but the downstream impacts are often uh, not considered. And I found that to be true. We are putting together a case study book on the uh, impacts of citizen scientists. The scientists, whoops, we missed a slide. Uh, the scientists um, uh, were very good at thinking about their science impacts, but not the societal impacts. There should be one more slide after this. Yes, there we go. Uh, lastly, there was a master's thesis by uh, Fauver in 2016 uh, that compared three different projects in citizen science. So it's a small sample size, but he also looked at variable costs. So he found that across three projects, when comparing uh, the citizen science uh, costs versus professional costs, that citizen science, uh, despite the perception that it is more cost effective, uh, was only somewhere between a two and 7% cost savings. Uh, the citizen science projects did require more time from the manager to engage the participants, uh, but the professional projects, run projects on the other hand, uh, spent more money on paid field technicians. So it was a balance, but that said, this is a small sample size. So I think what this shows is that there's very limited research in this area, and there's a lot of opportunities to look at the cost effectiveness, to look at the value. And uh, lastly, last slide. Data quality, right? So most, uh, in, in most instances, there's a positive correlation between overall data quality and, and price or valuation. Uh, data, citizen science has come a long way, again, if designed well. Uh, studies are now showing that the data quality can be comparable and in some cases even better because in some instances you may have uh, much better statistics, you know, more observations uh, than you would if you only had two or three grad students. Uh, so with that, I'd like to hand it over. Okay, this was great. Thanks to the panelists for staying within time. Um, it gives us a chance to uh, to raise some questions. Um, I actually didn't see any questions come across the uh, chat uh, mechanism. Um, so if you have questions from the audience, post them in the chat uh, chat area. Um, okay, I see that. I have one question, but there's no question. <laughs> so if we could have the question, that would be helpful. Uh, in the meantime. I will um, ask a question of my own, which is uh, that, that we've had presentations from Francoise, who kind of takes the long view, the big view. She's been working on this uh, issue of geovalue for a long time, and, and Jamie provided kind of an economic perspective on the nature of value, and Leah spoke about um, citizen science as, a, as 
I would I would argue is a is a beneficiary vector for uh, geo value, but. Uh, Directed at Francoise in particular, um, what what problems uh, have you seen in um, misunderstandings, challenges, uh, et cetera, to uh, the geo value story? Because it sounds to me pretty persuasive, uh, but we're still talking about it. That's a good question. Um, I think the as we've uh, been holding workshops and. Uh, other presentations we've been evolving over the uh, over the several years and an example of that when uh, we had our last uh, workshop in uh, uh, in conjunction with the geo plenary in washington dc we had half of the attendance being economists which was the first time in a, that we we had that many economists as part of the discussion so that's uh, at least one example of the evolution okay um there's a, a question from the audience about uh estimating the value of the consumer surplus of uh, data such as the NOAA data I, I think that this would be appropriate to be started by at least by jamie uh, why don't you describe yes, the yes. consumer surplus, the producer surplus, et cetera? And right. Well, somebody, up. yes, it, it, our, uh, the person that asked the question is, has, has that consumer surplus is the name for those aggregated valuations uh, that we have from the individuals that was, so that would be the area under the demand curve, technically. Uh, so the you know, the challenge is there have been efforts to measure uh, weather information. I would uh, refer them to work by Jeff Lazo, who has estimated the value of weather information. And so many times the way that you have to do it is you have to go to something possibly called contingent valuation, which you basically ask people through surveys uh, what they would be willing to pay for that information, although it is free to them. And I also wanted to point out that it may be free data, but it's not free. There is significant cost associated with generating some of that NOAA data. Uh, but the valuation estimates are really quite large when you start thinking about uh, asking people to give up the weather information that they pull off of their phone every morning. Uh, I, it's When you aggregate across our population, this is a very large number. But that's, uh, that's the challenge is that it's not market-driven information. This is public good information when it's uh, freely available. Okay, thank you. That's, uh, that's, that's helpful. There is another question that's directed at you. Uh, Jamie, um, oh. having it's, it's posted on the uh, it's it's fairly long, so yeah, I'm trying to read, trying to read so. all of it. Yeah, it's let's see here. Let me get to the top of this one. Wow, that is a long question. Okay, with uh, should I read this to everyone? Yeah. Well, why don't you go ahead? Yeah. Okay. And, and so it says, I talked about uh, how you have to understand individual preferences to understand perceived value of any data product to, to that individual. With many organizations and individuals not understanding Earth observation data and what it can do, who would be most effective to try to bridge that gap to understanding? Is it ESIP or ESIP? Is it the data owners? Is it an organization later in Francois' value chain, like a commercial organization? Uh, I would. My first answer is yes. I think all of these, or you know, all of these ideas can all all of these groups can help bridge the gap. Uh, I think what, uh, if you'll permit me for a moment, I think what the real challenge is is uh, 
gathering this data and making it publicly available is very expensive. And so the effort that all of these organizations are doing to try to assess how important this information, these, these data are, is, is really what the ESIP is about, what ge the geo-value community is about, and uh, certainly citizen science is a part of that too. Does that uh, answer that question? I think we need all of them. And if private industry can come in, uh, that, that is important as long as we understand that uh, in order for private industry, a commercial organization to come in, they must identify where it can be profitable for them to either condition the information in a way that is unique and especially usable, uh, or uh, then we have to look at uh, contribution. So, so one point um, that I think you can elaborate on a little bit that would help people here is the difference between cost and price. Um, you know, the, okay. some of these things that are, are uh, have have low or zero price actually have a cost. Certainly, I think ties to public goods and so forth. Yes, yes. Um, well, let's, uh, I'll try to think of. Uh, uh, a data product that is available, uh, and I'm going to use weather data as an example because it's so universally used, is uh, we, we utilize that weather data and uh, we would probably be quite willing to pay for it if we had to. And we do pay for it in the form of our tax contribution to the uh, to the National Weather Service that is providing that information to everybody. Uh, if that were closely held information, then there could be a market for it. Uh, but there is not, and so we have to go back to what is the cost of providing that information so widely. Uh, I was trying to think of another example and uh, maybe I'm going to just sit back and, and let uh, individuals think about this or some of my other uh, colleagues respond. Okay. This is Leah. I think, I think it's an important distinction to make uh, because with, with citizen science, they're volunteers, so it may not cost any, or there may not be a price to pay them salaries, but there's definitely a cost to engaging their time. Well, yeah, there's the opportunity cost of their time. If they, you know, they're clearly, they could have spent time, their time doing something else. And so uh, that that is a valuable resource that they have just contributed to this uh, a, sci a scientific endeavor. And well, uh, and there's also a cost, uh, additional training for them that you might not otherwise have to sure. um, pay with, with using tech, uh, paid professional help. I, I was going to ask uh, Yulia specifically um, what the relationship is between uh, the, the geo value story and citizen science, just an example or two. Uh, when you say geo value story, well, the geo value story is, is basically, well, for example, what we've just been talking about, Earth observation data uh, going into some kind of repository that are, that's then used for various purposes, among them weather forecasting or whatever. So, uh, well, I gave the example with with phenology. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there was, you know, another example that I had, but we cut the deck because of time. Um, Coco Ross, which is for the rain, hail, you know, precipitation, where they have 33,000 uh, volunteers who are using a standardized rain gauge and and measuring the, you know, conditions. That data is being incorporated into NOAA's uh, models to improve the models and the forecasts that, as with any weather data, 
you know, can have some downstream economic impacts or uh, impacts on decision making, impacts on, uh, dis you know, disaster response if you're talking about flooding. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so, what so in your, what in your view is a little bit on that? Sure. Uh, connect. So, I, I'm thinking about the, the sort of USGS product, the Can You Feel It, which is associated right. with earthquakes. Yep. Okay, mm -hmm. so in, in that case, uh, the individuals that have contributed and and uh, responded to the Can You Feel It website to say they've they've increased the resolution of the information that then the scientists can use, and so uh, that is a contribution by the citizens to to give a better resolution to the model, but in the end that is also a value to society because that improves our ability to uh, pinpoint and predict where the worst damage is from a hurt from a, a an earthquake and so the value it sort of comes back to those citizens that have contributed uh, that, yeah there's uh, on that, that project in particular is really good um they wouldn't let me we did a case study with did you feel it um I embedded a grad student in that team and we kind of uh, did an analysis. Um, it only cost them over a decade $50,000 to run that project. But they've had numerous scientific publications have come out of it. As you mentioned, uh, there's the education back to the individual volunteers who have learned about earthquakes. And as um, uh, I can't his name here, uh, David Wald, uh, one of the leads on the project, said that over time, some of the volunteers who live in earthquake prone areas got really good at describing uh, the consequences and became very engaged in the, in the learning the science of it as well. Uh, and that is certainly one of the values that uh, is touted with citizen science is increasing the, the data literacy and scientific literacy of those who participate. And some of the federal agencies are thinking that it may also lead to increased buy-in uh, of the citizenry in public decision making, uh, where that data, you know, helps to inform. Right. It should also have improved the the scientific models too. <laughs> so right. it, it, exactly. It, yeah. And led to papers. And and if we talk about the uh, tweet, um, uh, Twitter earthquake dispatch, that that um, uh, Paul Earl, Dr. Paul Earl, in coordination with the the first project that we mentioned runs, that's where they are using um, an algorithm to comb through Twitter for the word earthquake in 10 different languages. And in areas where they don't have dense sensor networks, uh, in other parts of the world, they're able to detect earthquakes uh, in as little as uh, uh, 60 seconds to two minutes. Um, whereas in some parts of the world where they don't have the traditional dense sensor networks, it, it may take them 20 minutes to pull that out of the data. And so when a certain number of tweets um, with the word earthquake in a specific region uh, triggers an alert that then uh, al you know, alerts the ch scientist and then he'll go check the scientific, uh, you know, the traditional scientific instruments uh, for that information. And so in a case with an earthquake where seconds count to save lives, having that immediate alerting can be very significant. So, so do, Leah, do you think this changes the way science gets done? I, I think it can, I, but yeah. I, I think citizen science, it's not a panacea. It is one scientific method in our toolbox uh, to be used um, when perhaps we can't do it any other way. So it, so it augments and enhances traditional scientific or traditional earth observation methods, uh, it does not replace. Okay. So I would, um, I would argue that it broadens it. <laughs> it broadens the scientific <laughs> method. Right. Well, it, it occurred to me that it, 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 it definitely fits with, with some people's definition of broadening participation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and here in Europe, uh, we did a little bit of this with the White House Citizen Science event in 2015 when we titled the event 
open science and innovation, um, putting citizen science in the context of open science, which at the time was more focused on open access to journals. But now, uh, particularly in Europe and the OECD, the group on Earth Observation, and there's a big uh, open science movement here in Europe with the EU Commission, uh, now citizen science is included in open access, open data, um, open hardware, open software, and open collaboration, of which citizen science could be one of those methods. Very good. Okay, I think I'm gonna um, leave the last word to Francoise. Uh, have you been working in this vineyard for a long time? Um, and there's a number of uh, webinars that are uh, going to follow this, and there's been some meetings that preceded it. Um, where, where do you think we go from here, Francoise? That's a very good question. Uh, I think first, one, one thing that we, we have alluded to but haven't really detailed is we've talked about cost and price and dollar value, but some of the valuation is also uh, very different, like saving lives, like improving the, uh, the lifestyles, the environment, and uh, those have to be included as well. So that's one consideration. Um, another consideration is that yes, use cases are critical. Examples are critical because it's a very complex field. We have a lot of different people coming from different organizations, different disciplines. And uh, it, it, the use cases really have to be there to help everybody refine the process to, to develop the uh, valuation. Excellent. Well, with uh, that, I'm going to turn this back to Erika, and I think we're going to end up more or less on time. Great. You did. Okay. I'm Arika Virapongsi, um, and I'm the principal scientist for Middle Path Eco Solutions, as well as the webinar series coordinator for ESIP. And I'd like to thank all the contributors to this webinar, and particularly our, our panelists and all the audience, everyone who could make it to this webinar. Um, and um, I want to point out again that this webinar is the first in our series. Um, it's part one, just one activity. The series is just one activity of um, that focuses on ESIP's theme about realizing the socioeconomic value of earth science data. So um, if you've been able to um, sign up on the sign up sheet, then um, you'll get some updates about some of the other activities that um, that ESIP will be holding. And I'll post that, um, that sign up sheet here again. Um, and so the webinar series are going, each webinar is gonna be held on the first day of the, the first Tuesday of the month at the same time as this one. Um, we're going to, the next webinar will be on August 7th on uh, value chain issues. Um, and then the September webinar will be on measuring and assessing um, socioeconomic value. And then the next three are um, to be developed, um, will potentially be linked to the ESIP clusters, um, some domain areas that are um, related to the socioeconomic value. Um, and then the series, if you've missed this webinar or you miss any of the other future webinars, um, the series will be recorded and available on the ESIP YouTube channel. So you can um, search for ESIP there on YouTube. It comes up easily. Or you can also click on this link here in the comment box um, and go directly to that channel. Um, some other ways to stay involved. This is the, a theme that interests you. You'd like to follow up on it. Um, follow the series. Um, add your email to the Google Sheet. Um, and then also in general, throughout this year, um, ESIP will be following up on this theme, um, helping you to link to some of these topics. So you can join the Monday update. Um, you can also, as Aaron mentioned, there's a lot of different clusters and working groups in ESIP. Um, if you look at the, the ESIP website, esipfed.org, you can look for some of those collaboration areas and see what might interest you and join in some of the calls. Um, there's also, ESIP has biannual meetings. So the next meeting is coming up. Um, it's at the, it's in Tucson, Arizona from um, July 17th to 20th. 
um, and um, registrations open now. So um, register as soon as you can. Um, and you can look through some of the plenary will be focused also on the socioeconomic value of earth science data. Um, and then we'll also be having some sessions that are specific to that theme. Um, and then around the community, um, some other events to look forward to is the value of information decision making in DC from in, in mid-November. And then also the ESA annual meeting has a similar theme, um, extreme events, ecosystem resilience and human well-being. And then also I just want to point out um, the geo value book that um, was published by some of the, by uh, both Jamie and, um, and Francois. Um, and um, I'm sending that link here. Um, so you can take a look at that if that interests you. Oops, sorry, came up twice. Um, and with that, um, I'd like to thank everybody for your participation. If you have any questions about the webinar or the series, or if you'd like to contact, um, if you'd like to contact some of the, um, any of the panelists or any of the contributors on this webinar, um, you can um, let me know and I'll pass on your questions. Um, so with that, we look forward to seeing you in August, on August 7th at the next webinar. Thank you very much.